I wonder, as you look to move more into Europe, open offices, make more investments, how does the prospect of a downturn in the nations, in the continent, color those decisions? Well, thank you for having me, Danny. And there could not be a better time to be a value investor. Um, the, there are many headwinds, as you just described. Uh, the market can, in many ways, not look pretty. But in fact, for a group like us, who's a long-term investor, prioritizes investing in cash flow generative assets and businesses, this environment actually limits competition and creates a ton of opportunity. I mean, we're now sitting on over $110 billion of cash and available capital. It's the most we've ever had in our history. And I think now is a very opportune time to have that kind of dry powder available for, for a market like Europe where some mm. of these things are, are uh, more challenging. Are, are people willing to sell right now? Because I, I ask that because I especially think of, of, of other private equity funds who maybe are looking at the prospect of selling at, at a pretty depressed multiple compared to what they bought at. I, who is selling and, and are they? Is, are, is, are the deals plentiful even if you want them? Well, Europe does slow down in August, so it's been not as active as it used to be. But, you know, we very, in the last 18 months, have put $30 billion to work. Uh, we did an acquisition very recently in uh, Deutsche Telekom's tower units in Germany. And uh, prior to that, we bought a company called Modulaire, pan-European leader in leasing ser modular leasing services for $5 billion. So we're putting capital to work. We're finding opportunities. Yes, there are those who aren't feeling any pressure to sell, probably aren't. If you mm -hmm. can hold on to an asset, if you have a long-term view, you probably would hold. But uh, Is that what we're seeing, private equity holding for longer? I would say in most cases, private equity sponsors that aren't, uh, do not have uh, an issue in the debt markets would hold for longer. Well, what are the ramifications of that? of companies being private for longer? You know, if you've bought a business, as we often do, prioritizing the cash flows, and you underwrote situations like this, you took a long-term view, you're fine holding businesses for longer because they're generating cash. In, in situations where a business is not generating as much cash, you're not able to pull out that dividend or that yield, you might be in a more of a challenging situation. Mm. And in, in terms of sort of your sector mix, when folks think about Brookfield, they probably think about, you know, industrials. They, of course, think about the infrastructure segment of Brookfield as well. Do you need to shift away from that if you are looking at especially, you know, capital intensive energy uh, industries, industries that need to use a lot of energy when it's really expensive right now, that prospect being a difficult one in this environment? So we have been investing in new sectors. Uh, Technology is one where we've made a, a large uh, investment, many large investments, been growing fairly significantly. But uh, the type of technology we invest in is what I like to call industrial technology. This is cash flow generative, generative, mature, profitable businesses that provide essential products and services that are hard to be replaced or replicated. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what new shiny toy comes out, no one's replacing their Bloomberg terminals. <laughs> in the same way, we like to invest in businesses that are very sticky, even if they are tech. So they mm. have the same characteristics as an industrial or an infrastructure company. And uh, we recently acquired a company called CDK in the US, $8.3 billion. This company has 70% market share of large US auto dealerships. Mm. And so it's not going away, nothing's changing. Do they um, trade like tech or industrials though? And that's the great thing, is that the NASDAQ being down of 25% this year, yeah. um, it has brought some of the great tech names down with it. And that was a public to private where we thought it was a pretty uh, great opportunity, I think in uh, time, we'll look back and see it was maybe one of our best investments. Well, this, this goes back to this idea of, you know, are private investors selling? Is, are we going to look back on 2022 as, you know, the year of take privates where that's where the most ample opportunity is? I think we could. Um, in 2008 and 2009, many firms like ourselves and, and many others actually made some of their best investments. Uh, these cycles, again, if you take a long-term view, as long as you underwrite and you plan for the uh, bumps in the road that we have ahead, uh, this would be a great time. New public markets are not valuing businesses the way the private markets are. Sometimes they're valuing them better, and at that time you see a lot of IPOs. Today, I think private sponsors should be doing more public mm. to privates. So when you are having the conversations with your portfolio companies, again, I, I go back especially to this idea, maybe not the tech ones, but ones that are having to deal with high inflation, with energy costs. When you're looking at a scenario of, let's say, demand rationing in areas like Germany, which you're pushing more into, Absolutely. What do those conversations look like? What, do, what does the playbook look like for the emergency scenario? So in this case, you know, we've, uh, we've always followed a mantra of investing in businesses where we underwrote a downturn from the beginning. Mm -hmm. For 12 years, maybe that hasn't always happened, but what it did mean was we bought businesses that were resilient, high quality, and generated cash. And uh, as uh, Howard Marks once said, uh, 
always uh, never forget the six foot man who died crossing the stream that was on average five feet deep. <laughs> We like to plan ahead for these environments, and so our businesses that we own today, our portfolio is quite resilient. That same approach, if we apply it as a long-term investor, if we just look at the long-term cash flows, these, this next six to 12 months, as difficult as it might be, will not make a huge impact on the total value of the I business see. over time. D does that mean you need to pull those levers, like cutting costs, rising prices, price, passing prices along? Is that happening more now? Uh, great businesses that are mission critical and provide an essential product or service can pass on those price increases. We are seeing that happen in many cases. Um, in many cases, we actually are implementing, we always implement an operational improvement plan. It's where we think we get the majority of our returns. Mm. It's always been our thesis, our fundamental underwriting thesis, even in technology. And uh, it's where we continue to see opportunity today. So I, I got to press you just finally on, on one thing your CEO said in, in the earnings call last. He talked about, you know, private equity being among the most difficult to fundraise with in private capital right now. When you're having conversations with LPs, with investors, kind of what are what are their biggest fears right now? What, what do you need to calm them of and assuage them of in this current environment? Look, they, they want to see cash flow. And I think um, buying businesses that generate a lot of cash that are highly cash generative and withstand the test of time is very important. Thankfully, that's an area we spend a lot of time in. And I think they are they're consolidating amongst uh, a few managers who have the capability, have a global setup, have a deep operational capability to deliver these returns.